Mary. Uh, good afternoon. It's nice to see so many of you here this afternoon, and I'm afraid it's going to be a bit embarrassing for me because I have to confess that I have no idea what the achievement gap is. Now you chuckle. Do you know what the achievement gap is? Anyone who thinks you know what it is, raise your hand. See? Oh, we have one, we have one thousand. What do you think the achievement gap is? The difference is in Consensus on that? Is that what people think the achievement gap is? Well, I had no idea. So I did what I usually do when I have no idea about things. I did some research. I went looking for the achievement gap. And what I did was in the uh, site information literature, I searched for the word achievement gap anywhere in any articles that had ever been published. And there were 4,069 uh, citations. So then I looked to see whether any of them had results, because I figured if they were studying the achievement gap and they had results, that must mean there were some empirical studies going on about whatever this thing is. And there were 1,605 studies that actually reported results of some sort. Then I looked at the studies that mentioned race. Uh, that number decreased to 145. So achievement gap results in race only yielded 145. And then when I said, well, what's in peer-reviewed? Presumably peer-reviewed articles tell us that the, there's some consensus about how the person is defining achievement gap. And there were only 46 peer-reviewed articles. So, I'm searching. So then I looked at those 46 to see uh, what they could tell me about what the achievement gap meant. Um, of those articles, race was the most commonly mentioned term, though not necessarily the most commonly studied term. 13% uh, of studies looked at one racial group. Uh, the race, when there were one racial group studies, they were usually about Asians or, or white college students. 50% uh, of the studies looked at two or more racial groups in one way or another. Um, some of the studies that purported to be about the achievement gap didn't mention race at all, and others used euphemisms like at-risk populations. What they studied um, was very diverse. Only 27% thought the achievement gap had anything to do with test scores. 23% uh, thought it had to do with GPA. Uh, other academic things, uh, about 10% looked at things like whether students dropped out. And another 20% looked at various things like whether uh, students preferred teachers who were culturally responsive or whether teachers thought students were problems in the classroom. Um, all of these things were thought to have something to do with the achievement gap, but it wasn't clear to me what they might have to do with it. Moreover, uh, many of these studies that purported to be about the achievement gap, of them, only 30% actually did anything that looked at disparities between groups, and so therefore could be said to be studying a gap. Uh, some said they were studying a gap, but their study had nothing to do with looking at a gap. And then there were others that maybe were looking at a gap, but they defined gap as uh, in different sorts of ways. For example, there were gap studies that looked at English as a second language learners versus non-second language learners. Or there were studies that uh, looked at parental practices and where they differ between groups, and that was considered to be a gap. And so in essence, what I got from my search of the literature is that really, the professionals, the experts in this field, may not know what an achievement gap is either, and if they do, they didn't communicate it in a way that I could understand. So if we don't know what the gap is, or we have inconsistent uh, definitions about the gap, how can we do interventions that are going to change the achievement gap in directions that we are likely to change? 
Well, if the field won't change, I'm always willing to offer ways that I can help it. And so my idea is instead of thinking about an achievement gap, which uh, involves a comparison between groups, why don't we begin to look at the life experiences of the populations that we're interested in, the populations we're thinking about as achievement uh, deficient. I developed the concept of what I call life trauma units. And these are stressful and traumatic uh, life events that happen in, uh, in uh, the lives of students, particularly in my case, the lives of high school students. And these events are the kinds of things that either make it difficult for them to participate in school and certainly inhibits their uh, tendency to engage in school activities. So I think pretty much the policy should be based on helping students cope with LTUs rather than ignoring uh, these incidents in their life, and rather than expecting the students to be resilient and perform in spite of the number and quality of uh, LTUs in their lives. To deal with this issue, um, Miriam Jernigan and I developed the counseling advocacy model um, in 2010, actually 2009, the year before she left. Uh, what the counseling advocacy model is designed to do is to identify the students in the middle, the students who are neither high achievers according to the school standards, nor students who are low achievers according to the school standards, uh, the lost students in a sense, the students that no one pays attention to. And we wanted to identify their strengths, but also to help them to deal with the uh, traumatic life units in their lives that might inhibit their ability to engage in school. Our notion was that if you can at least get them to engage in school, whatever it is that the you're trying to get them to achieve with respect to, they'll have more opportunity than if they're not engaged in school. So with the Jeremiah Burke School, school what we did was we uh, developed the counseling advocate model uh, at the Boston campus. And then we uh, solicited people who would join us in our effort to implement it in the school system. And the Burke School volunteered to help us in this effort. So over the course of the uh, development of this project, we have had uh, considerable help from the uh, supervisor in charge of counseling at the Burke School, Cheryl Wendell, um, as well as <laughs> me. Um, <laughs> the idea is that what we do is that we uh, have advocates for uh, each student who's identified by the school. The school provides site supervision for these advocates and Boston College through the Institute uh, provides training. So, um, this, the description of the site supervision at the BERT, I hope that's visible. Um, through the first three years, Cheryl Wendell was the supervisor. What she would do would be to meet weekly with the volunteers who are advocates. Uh, we've had diff various uh, supervisors, and uh, the box on the left just kind of shows you who's participated. The supervisors had the job of um, matching the Boston College advocates with students in the Burke School. So the supervisors uh, secure parental consent, the supervisors uh, supervise the advocates, uh, and the supervisors uh, uh, actually provide progress reports to us concerning the work of the advocates. The advocates themselves are first-year students in our mental health program, um, and we have from five to ten each year. They volunteer to work with students at least one day a week. Um, I actually think it's turns out to be more than one day a week, but they volunteer to work for one day a week. Um, what they do is they try to be someone who can not only help the students deal with LTUs on the short term, but can also teach the students how to deal with these once the advocates are no longer there. We get the advocates through the principles and techniques course here. Um, uh, we set up what are what used to be called social justice labs. We may call them something else now. I'm not sure. So we're, it's, it's in process. We may give it another name someday. But at the moment, there's social justice labs. The social justice labs are the students who volunteer to be advocates in the school system. 
So when they do that, they go through advocate training. Uh, advocate training can include helping them to recognize and deal with tra uh, trauma events in the student's life. Advocate training includes things such as how do you start a conversation with adolescents in the school. In general, there's, the training covers a, a wide uh, breadth of skills that are parallel to counseling but aren't actually counseling skills because it's a first-year student, they're not really yet trained to do counseling. Um, at BC, uh, we also do supervision to monitor the progress of the uh, advocates. Um, and then we train the advocates to use what we call the assessment for life uh, trauma uh, units. And we do that through the advocate training program. Um, and let me just show you what that might look like. Uh, well, first, I guess I'll show you the advocates' role. Well, the advocates do a lot. They're supposed to be the student's champion, so they support the student um, no matter who is angry or upset with the student. It's the advocate's goal to see the positive side of the student and help the institution see that as well. They're also a mentor, so they may do anything from help the student figure out how to plan their uh, day schedule to helping them to understand why the teacher is yelling at them when uh, they are not doing what the teacher wants them to do. They're also a friend. Many of the students in the high schools, particularly in the mid-range groups, don't have friends. And so the advocates uh, may teach them skills to help them to build their social network. They may be advisors. And they're liaisons. We like to think of the advocates as not only the student supporters, but also people who support the teachers in the system. So it's not unusual for uh, the students to have problems with the teachers and not know how it is that you negotiate those problems. The advocates teach them those kinds of skills. Uh, the advocates tell me sometimes they're going around in circles. <laughs> okay. Um, Natasha Torkelson and I developed the LTU assessment. Uh, she's a diversity fellow and this was her first year project. And what we do essentially is to assess across these six domains. We ask students about these uh, uh, domains during uh, interviews. Um, during conversations with them, the advocates find out this kind of information. We think that these are the sites where uh, LTUs are most likely to occur based on our understanding of developmental literature. Um, Natasha and I analyzed case notes from the advocates to get a sense of what the traumatic life events might be. Uh, case notes from the advocates as well as my supervision notes. And um, some general things, uh, parents and home life are a significant issue in their lives. Um, sometimes the issues are just that, or just, the issues that the, are that their parents don't support them, uh, either financially or emotionally. Sometimes the issues are issues related to uh, abuse, um, being stressed in the family setting. Uh, sometimes the stress is so much that they just stay away from home. And so they show up at school feeling tired and sleepy, and no one knows why it is that, they, that they're that they tired and sleepy. Uh, often it's because they just can't stay home, so, so they are up all night roaming the streets or doing something of the sort. Um, many of the students are dealing with divorce, and they don't talk about it with anyone. There's no place for them to talk about the divorce. And contrary to what much of the literature would suggest, these kids will really miss the parent who's not there. And so they're often in mourning for a divorced parent. Many of the students deal with multiple deaths uh, of one or, or both parents. They never talk about it. Um, most of them ha have a feeling that they're alone, that they're the only one in the school who's lost a parent. Um, and so they're mourning the loss of a parent without any way to talk about uh, those circumstances. Um, in the academic domain, um, individualized education plans are a major issue. Um, 
the kinds of issues that occur or that the school personnel might not know that the student has an IEP, um, even though it might be on file. And so the student may go through actually several years of their education uh, without ever having their individualized education program. Many of the IEPs may be outdated. Um, one student, for instance, was assessed when he was in the, in the third grade and they were still operating as though that IEP was effective, even though now he was an honor student in, uh, in high school. And so they may be outdated. Um, IEPs uh, say that there are certain accommodations that students should receive, and they don't. Not having an IEP despite meeting one is a big issue, and not recognizing that some of the behavioral issues that students display in classes may be because they, in fact, need an IEP is a big issue. The IEP coordinator is tremendously overworked. Um, chances are probably half of the population in her, in her school needs an IEP of one sort or another. Um, but it's, it's impossible for one person to handle these duties. Um, the, uh, the advocates uh, try to help to meet these needs, but there needs to be something more systematic in place. But what the advocates can do that parallels what would happen to students in the suburbs is that they can agitate the system to get the student's plan. Uh, if you're in the suburbs and uh, you have a child who needs an IEP, parents call every day, where's my child's IEP? They test you. Uh, parents uh, of these students don't have time to, to do that. They don't have time or they don't have the kind of jobs to do this or they don't know that they should do this. So what the advocates uh, do is they pester people. They keep saying, where's the IEP for my student? And by pestering people, they're able to get some action in this domain, even though they feel really sorry for the IEP coordinators that are doing this. Uh, Teacher-student relations. Teachers feel disrespected, but students also feel disrespected. And so sometimes it's often a loop where uh, they're dealing with each other out of this domain of disrespect. The advocates are often able to have conversations with the teachers to under get a better understanding of what their issue is with the student and then to translate that issue to the student in a way that they can hear that. Uh, students get into arguments with teachers and vice versa. Um, advocates can often intervene to find out what the area of tensions are that's causing these uh, arguments. Um, many of the students are not uh, first language English speakers, but people presume they are because of their racial group. And so what often happens is that they get put into classes where the teaching style doesn't really fit uh, English as second language learner. For instance, uh, worksheets. Uh, in some classes, they're doing lots of worksheets in English language, but if you don't read that very well, then that's not something that you're going to do very effectively. And so they act out. Um, advocates are often able to point out these, this kind of information to uh, teachers. Other students are dealing with outdated textbooks. And so it's not that they don't want to learn what's happening, it's that they are bored. They don't understand why they have to read about things that happened 10 years ago uh, when they're not talking about things that are happening now. So eventually they give up. They may complain for a while and then they give up. Um, the advocates have been particularly effective at helping them to, in many ways, engage in learning uh, in spite of the uh, resources that are available to them. And then the uh, uh, being called negative things. If you come from a, a home of abuse, which many of these students do, when someone says, calls you by negative names, um, those are in effect threatening and fighting kinds of words. And so advocates in the past have also been effective in sitting in classes and helping teachers to understand why they might think that name calling motivates students, but why it might not motivate these particular kinds of students. Uh, major mental health issues, um, depression and suicide attempts, often um, 
the students may attempt suicide, attempt suicide, and the advocates may be the first persons to learn about that. There's major stress and anxiety. Um, psychosomatic symptoms, such, such as sleeping during class. There is a tendency to think that sleeping during class uh, always means that the students stayed up late. But there have been several instances over the year where sleeping during class actually indicated some other kinds of problems, um, such as uh, major depression, um, uh, well, such as major depression. One advocate, for instance, writes in her notes about a student who says that she wants to stay awake, but she just can't. Uh, she doesn't know why, and no one knows why. That student was effective in getting her uh, referred to the health service in the school so that they could do a, not a diagnosis as to whether there were physiological reasons for why she couldn't stay awake. Uh, some students exhibit uncontrolled anger and rages. Um, and there aren't enough programs in place to help them figure out alternative ways to deal with those. Overall, one could say that there are major mental health issues that require uh, some attention, but they usually don't get the kind of attention they require. Mental health issues are more often related to being suspended, to missing school, and sometimes students just disappear. The advocates have been very effective in at, uh, looking for uh, disappeared students. Sometimes students disappear in the school. Um, no one knows where they are. They check in and then they're gone. Uh, they're in the school somewhere, but no one knows where. Advocates find the hiding places and they are able to look for the <coughs> students. When they disappear completely out of the school, advocates are the people who advocate for finding the students, for not letting them disappear, for trying to reach out to them in one way or another. Lack of resources, uh, personal resources. Uh, needing glasses and being unable to afford them. Uh, this has serious consequences in many cases, not only because they can't see what they're supposed to be learn, learning, but in some cases, students are, are bullied. Actually, there's a lot of bullying going on. Uh, and one example is that a uh, person, uh, a boy or a girl, uh, needed glasses and couldn't see uh, who was bullying him or her outside of the school system uh, because um, uh, the, the student was nearsighted. And so um, people would uh, approach and uh, there was nothing the student could do because the student couldn't see. Uh, one of the advocates was particularly successful in uh, locating an agency that would provide free glasses for this person so that at least she could uh, see who was uh, bullying her. And she was also able to uh, get the school to enforce the uh, anti-bullying policy, at least in the school. The problem is the anti-bullying policy doesn't pertain to outside the school, and many of these students uh, live in circumstances where they are bullied on a, on a regular basis and don't really have any protection. Not having a winter coat and having to walk to school in the snow. Um, Sometimes teachers provide uh, uh, resources for these students um, if they know that they need them, but that shouldn't actually be the, the teacher's job. And so we need something that uh, is in effect that doesn't embarrass the student, but yet lets them have the resources that they need. Um, I was happy to hear that there was a, a food program somewhere at the Boston schools because a lot of these kids are hungry. Um, they're hungry for uh, different reasons, um, but they're hungry. Uh, most of the advocates now know that when they have an interview with a student, they should at least bring snacks, because uh, students need uh, snacks. Um, other situations, needing surgery and not having anyone notice. Um, advocates have been particularly effective in uh, sometimes going with the student to have the surgery but certainly alerting the system to the need and setting up the uh, opportunities for the students to receive the health care that they need. Um, these are this year's advocate program. And 
besides being outstanding advocates, the reason they're listed uh, is because they helped me think about what policy would be useful for working with LTUs in the school system. And so here are our, our suggestions. I call these micro-level policy implications because they are things that I think could probably be accomplished with relatively minor resources but would make a major difference in the lives of the students, uh, particularly in the Burke School, but maybe students in urban schools more generally. Um, the schools have police officers in the building. Um, the police officers actually, uh, in many cases, have friendly relationships with some of the students. But there is really, they, even, they, they buy them treats, they buy them snacks as well. But there's no formal system that uh, is designed to build mutual trust between the students and the police more generally. And so the school could actually do something like uh, have uh, police student socials where the idea was just to get to know each other as people rather than as police officer student or student police officer. Um, students should be assessed for their language competence in English. Um, there is a tendency to think that if students are look African American, for example, that they are African American when in fact uh, a significant portion of the kids who are so classified are not African, African American. And their language is not English. Uh, rather, they come from different kinds of backgrounds. Um, one example of how this could be a problem is that there is a, a student who speaks Spanish. Uh, he speaks, or his background is Spanish. He speaks English very well. Uh, he's smart, so he was placed in an advanced placement class. But the advanced placement class he was placed in was for history, <coughs> where what he's doing is reading English all the time. He hates that class. He hates that class because he's not that proficient in reading English. Uh, we know from Dr. Brisk's work that you can speak English with not, without being able to read it at the level that you need to. Um, they won't let him out because they think that, in effect, uh, Having a history, AP history class would be good for him if he goes on to college. And so the advocates kind of try to help the school system recognize the uh, disadvantages to the student of not taking into account their language backgrounds. There should be enhanced mental health services. Um, right now there are probably a couple of mental health counselors, but that's not nearly enough to cover all the needs of these students uh, that uh, we recognize. Uh, the advocates and I think there should be uh, grief groups, groups where students who have lost parents can at least find someone like themselves to talk about those issues, uh, groups where students have, who have lost peers uh, can talk about those issues, and there are even students who have lost uh, peers and siblings to violence, and they should be able to uh, talk about those issues somewhere. Um, there ought to be different types of groups for different types of trauma. Um, divorced parents are a big issue for these students, and there's no place where they get to talk about it, I suppose because the myth is that uh, these students are raised by single parents anyway. Um, but many of them start out with two parents, they just lose one of them. And then the uh, advocates say, uh, if we can't expand the professional mental health services, maybe what we can at least begin to do is develop uh, peer phone trees where students could be in contact with other students who are like themselves just to talk about the kinds of issues that they share in common. Okay. Uh, Micro-level policies. Uh, many of these uh, students have Respons home responsibilities that require them to take care of younger sibs. And so that means they're always late to school. Being late to school counts against you academically. So the advocates say, well, why couldn't either the school start an hour later for these students, or how about not scheduling core courses during the first hour? If, if uh, in fact, math and English, which are important for the MCAS, were scheduled later, then these students would be there in time to take these courses. 
Many of the students are in shelters and have been in shelters for a long time. Uh, we need social services to do something about moving them out of these shelters faster. Uh, the school could set up welcoming committees for these students so that instead of being the victims of bullies, uh, it would encourage the bullies to become um, more positive agents in the system. Um, there should be support counseling for teachers. We know that uh, trauma, uh, coping with traumatized people also traumatizes the coper, and so we need services for that. Okay. Uh, so the big policy implications, we need more funding for mental health services. Uh, we recommend that uh, a significant part of this be the relational advocacy kinds of programs because um, in many cases students won't go for services that are called mental health services, but we actually have a waiting list for students who want an, uh, an advocate. So alternate models of mental health are important. We need full service occupational centers uh, through which these students could uh, not only in earn income, but also have their own skills recognized. Although I haven't talked about their skills, there are many talented students who uh, don't get uh, any attention with respect to their skills. Um, there are some uh, students who are remarkably talented with respect to computers, for instance. There ought to be a way to use those computer skills to help them economically. There are students who are very talented with respect to music. There ought to be some way to help them use those skills uh, to increase their income or to at least engage them in the school process. And finally, I think that the goals for public education need to change to reflect the realities of the students in the schools. Rather than uh, trying to fix the achievement gap, which we don't know what it is and so therefore we can't fix it, maybe what we need to do is to work on issues such as engagement, which is something that we could have an effect on. Thank you.
across the nation, national representative sample, with the um, Arms Forces Qualifications Test. These kids were ages 14 to 21 at the time. Ten years later, by the end of the 1980s, they were ages 24 to 31. They'd been in the workforce, they had wages, and you can start to look and see what, how the things we had measured at the end of the 1970s predicted outcomes at the end of the 1980s. And I can remember dropping a test score into a wage equation and knocking out almost all of the black-white hourly earnings gap. Test scores measure things that employers pay for, skills, things that people can do. And if it's the case that the skills a test measure predict earnings and actually predict most of the wage gaps that I became an economist to help close, then there was nothing more important that I could figure out to do than help to close these skill gaps. All right? And so gradually, from the end of the 1980s through the 90s, I transitioned over from thinking about business development and how to attract businesses to figuring out how to get kids skills. Okay, uh, out of school time programming, schools, parenting, and, and other kinds of things. And we started the Achievement Gap Initiative at Harvard maybe almost 10 years ago now, and also the other work that I've been doing in schools, all of which is trying to figure out how to get skills to the kids who have less access to those skills. Now, the, there are lots of different ways of thinking about this. And, um, A lot, the, the core of the way I think about it is we've got to change kids' lived experiences. Okay, one way or another, kids acquire their skills through their lived experiences. And at this point in time, there are a lot of people all around the country stepping up trying to be part of this, trying to find ways to help to equalize lived experiences for kids in order to narrow the gaps we care about, not only in test scores, that's just an indicator of something, in life outcomes and an opportunity to realize their human potential is what this is all about. And if you think about this long term, we are all part of the long wave of, of human history. And it's our turn now to take the next few steps. It's our generational responsibility to try to be sure that the children we, whose lives we have some influence over have the opportunity to realize their, self, their, their potential. I threw this picture of my grandmother in here because she was my inspiration. Um, she went to be 100 years old. That picture's on her 100th birthday. This is, uh, I usually start with a poem, but since time is short, short I, I didn't use one. I may throw one in later. But, you know, well, my flesh is weak, my soul is tired. I pass the torch to you. Inside this flame live many dreams. Now you must see them through. And all of us are living out the dreams of prior generations. All of us are just part of that flow. And we have, a, we have a role to play. We have jobs to do in this. Um, I'm going to touch on, well, first of all, the title the Elements of a 21st Century Movement for Excellence with Equity. There are achievement gaps. There are many achievement gaps. Um, but talking about achievement gaps is not that useful. Okay, we want to close them, but you can close achievement gaps by pulling higher achievement groups down. Okay, the goal is not to close the gaps. The goal is to help all kids reach their potential which I talk about is excellence with equity. And I'll say a bit more about what I mean that, about that in a second. But um, I want to talk quick, just quickly, I'll talk about uh, this notion of excellence with group proportional equality, a little bit about urgency and possibility, and then from an ecological point of, of view, uh, parenting, teaching parenting school culture. One of the poems I would have started with does talk about counseling. Counseling is not explicitly on the list, but it's in there. Okay, and then, uh, and then the role of employers, civic organizations, collective responsibility, put all this stuff together. So it's a big picture, and I can only go through it quickly. But I want to emphasize that policy is not the main thing either. Just like achievement gaps, just closing achievement gaps is too small an aspiration. Uh, policy is a fourth line down. Okay, the movement is everybody who feels this sense of urgency and this sense of possibility to do something, to make a difference. Okay, and that's all of us, it's all lots of other people. Um, inside a movement, there are lots of goals. People tend to disagree about what the most important goals are, and that's good, because they spread themselves across the work. Some people say, well, early childhood caregiving is most important. Other, well, no, the people who serve early young parents are most important, the physicians and the roles that they play. Other people say, well, no, it's third grade reading. You've got to get kids so they can read by third grade. The people who help do that, their work is most important. 
Other folks say, no, it's the counselors who help the kids to deal with trauma and who take care of all these issues that it's nobody else's job to take care of. Okay? Other people say, no, it's those folks who are helping the young people identify their future careers when they're in, in adolescence so they can put themselves on track to go from school to career as they move on. So all kinds of different goals inside the movement, which is good. For any given goal, there are strategies, there are recipes. So what we heard in the first presentation was a pretty detailed and interesting recipe for how to deal with some of the issues that adolescents face, particularly in high schools. Okay, with the goal of, of, of helping kids to cope with some of the trauma and the, the confusion and the turmoil in their lives that they have. So that they come out the other end with their head on straight and ready to, to move into life. Okay, so they're, for any big given goal, there are strategies. And policies finally are, provide the resources and the authorizations to help implement the strategies to achieve those goals. Okay? The work takes place in the context of programs and projects. The school year is like a program. You, it has a life cycle. You start to go through. You do a play out stuff. Inside the programs, there are principles and practices. What do you actually do? And what, is it, and what are the norms and the rules and, and so on? So as we think about getting the work done, there's work, there's thinking to do at every level of this thing. You go into people and say, oh yeah, I know the answer. Well, <clears throat> tell me what, what your goals are, what your strategies are, where your resources are coming from, what the programming looks like, what the principles and practices inside those are going to look like. And none of us can do it all, so it's a, it's a collective endeavor, and we have to each hope that other people do their part of it so it all comes together and works well. The goal, for, as far as I'm concerned, is what I call group proportionate quality with excellence. Uh, most of the achievement kind of measures that we can identify have something that looks like a bell-shaped curve for each group. There are inequities within groups. There's some kind of curve that describes it, and you can usually measure it and draw it. The standard metric for measuring achievement gaps nationally is to go to the, to, to the, uh, to the NAEP, National System of Educational Progress. You can identify groups, you can look at gaps between groups and the scores. There are all kinds of other ways to do it too, but if you could graph scores by racial group, the NAEP or something, you could find curves that look like this. And this might be blacks and Latinos in the United States, for example. Then the red curve might be white kids in the United States. And the gap is the difference between those two curves. Okay, you can look at the difference between the, the, the midpoints, or you can look at it in more sophisticated ways. But the goal is not just to bring those curves together. The goal is to move both curves up. Okay, because white kids aren't doing as well as they could do either. And then we all want to get up to the green curve, which I say represents excellence. And we want to get there in a way where over the long term we reach a point where race gives you not a, not a clue where somebody is under that curve. Where the percentage of each group under the top, the middle, and the bottom is pretty much the same. So seeing knowing somebody's skin color tells you nothing about what their achievement is going to be. And at that point you've got excellence with equity and I'm arguing that's the aspiration. For any particular school district that wants to work on school that gap, argues they should use external benchmarks. Do not focus on the gap within the district between different groups. But that's like a zero-sum game. White, white parents got no interest in that. I know superintendents who lost their jobs because they got too excited about closing racial achievement gaps in the district, and white parents actually elected new slates of people to the school board in order to replace them. And both people I know I'm talking about quit before they could be fired. But um, if you take the statewide average for white kids, for example, and you're trying to bring all your groups in the district up to the statewide average for white kids, if your black and Latino kids are performing at the statewide average to white, as far as I'm concerned, you've closed the racial achievement gap in whatever measure you're looking at. Your white kids might be above average, you can choose some other benchmarks. But anyway, it's the external benchmark that allows the whole community to come together around a particular agenda. If you're looking at internal comparisons, that, that just creates political problems and doesn't get to the level of consensus and commitment that you might have. The, why do we think we can do this? Well. The, if you look at the best data we have for one-year-olds, we find very little difference at all. Okay, there's a test called the Bailey test. You can critique it. You can argue all kinds of reasons why you shouldn't take it seriously. But that's, what, that's what we got. And in the Early Childhood Longitudinal Survey, nationally representative data, we find very little difference at all between groups as of age one. By age two, the differences are stark. And I'll show you the, the chart in a minute, which means we've got to reach kids at birth. And the things that we can do to change the life experiences of infants that will stop the gaps, that will, that will at least retard, and we can hope even stop the gaps from opening 
very early. We're learning a lot from research about what the early childhood life experiences are that affect uh, development, even in infancy and toddlerhood. So I think there's a lot of potential, even early childhood. But then IQ gaps. People talk about IQ as if that's the biologic measure of something. Well, IQ score is the Flynn effect came up with about 20, I think it's 17 IQ points during the 20th century for the entire United States population. Humans don't change biologically that fast. But even IQ tests or skills tests, people acquire skills through their life experiences. And the standard life experiences in the U.S. changed during the 20th century that led all these IQ numbers to come up. Meanwhile, even as we were all rising as a nation, the racial IQ gap closed by about a quarter between 1970 and 2000. Okay, Bill Dickens and Jim Flynn did, did that work on looking at the norming test. So they had to keep renorming the IQ back down to 100 with a standard deviation of 15, and the racial gap was narrowing even at the same time. Okay, so the fact that these things are not written in stone, that the function of life experience comes through when we look at the IQ data. Um, in the National Assessment of Educational Progress, 62% of the black-white reading score gap for 17-year-olds disappeared between 1971 and 1988. Biologic changes don't disappear that fast. There were changes in life experience, there were changes in what was happening in school. We, there's a debate, there re, there's a remaining debate about why we made so much progress so fast. There are things about uh, these kids who became 17 year olds in the late 80s were the children of the Civil Rights Revolution. Okay, their parents had had new opportunities that people of color had not had before. Okay, you also had all the uh, school integration legislation. There are also things going in popular youth culture. There's a lot of stuff that may feed into it. But more than half, 62%, narrowing in 17 years, says these things are not written in stone. We can do something about that. Uh, the trend for nine-year-olds, nine-year-old black and Latino kids now have higher math scores than white kids had in 1978. So if in 1978 somebody wanted to claim, well, no, you can't do anything about these. These are genetic. Well, like, we're already higher than where white kids were. Okay, and so there are all kinds of reasons to think, you know, we can do this, okay? Uh, and there are schools that are hitting home runs. They're, they're really getting it done. They're doing things with kids that people say couldn't be done with those kids. So the, um, as I talk through some of what I'm going to say, what I'm, I'm basically going to argue that we need to change kids' lived experiences where they live. They live interacting with their families, with their friends, with their teachers, with their school counselors. We need to change those lived experiences and we need to work down through all the channels to get there. Because if what we do doesn't touch kids, it doesn't make any difference. Okay? And so if we think about, to keep in mind, so child and youth lived experiences, at the end of this thing, um, parent-teacher behaviors are a big chunk of it. And we can affect parent-teacher's behaviors directly through um, various kinds of interventions. We can also just acknowledge that there are all kinds of historically based reasons that parents are doing what they are. Okay, um, parents are under all, particularly poor parents are under all kinds of stresses. They don't have bandwidth sometimes to pay attention to the things that we would want them to pay attention to. So those be some of some of the reasons. But the intervention may be to help them deal with that bandwidth issue, right? And so we've got a lot of reasons that, that things are the way that they are. Then we could talk about intervening to affect the background reasons. We could talk about affecting uh, federal income um, support policies, earned income tax credit, and employer uh, pay parental leave when people are having babies. And all those kinds of things could affect stuff coming around this way. Then there are also alternative explanations that don't come this route at all. They come, that come almost directly up to the kids, and then there are ways that these historical forces don't work through parents and teacher behaviors. They have to work directly on the kids' lived experiences over there. So there are all kinds of connections in here, and we don't have to deny any of those connections to choose one or two to focus on. Okay, so what I'm going to focus on is this connection here, of what parents and teachers do over to what kids experience, and then some of the things that we can do to influence that and I totally endorse and appreciate the idea that counselors have a huge role to play in helping parents and teachers and kids to get this work done. Uh, there are far, the, the ratio of kids to counselors is a, is, a, is a crime. 
I mean, it's way too low. We have, I mean, we have both the counselors counseling that helps kids to navigate social life, and we have a whole set, different set of counseling issues that's having, helping kids identify careers. You know, the career counseling and figure out who, which options does any particular child have, and how do we help them a, a connect with those options, whether there's some kind of training after, after high school or a four-year college degree or whatever it is. There's a whole other set of issues we could talk about that have to do with the infrastructure, the institutional infrastructure for that school to career transition work. Okay, this big picture tries to put a lot of it in one image, and I'm going to talk quickly around the outside circles in this, but if you think about mainly where kids are, they're at home with their parents, they're with school with their teachers and the other educators, they're in groups with their friends, those are the three main groups, and then we've got employers and the rest of the community as sources of resources and supports for those. But the parenting piece, or parents piece, we have parenting and we have parent engagement. <coughs> parenting is what parents do at home with their kids when the door is closed. People don't like to talk about it because it seems like you get in other people's business. You know, how dare you come telling me how to parent? Um, you're being, you know, culturally imperialist. Well, there are things that parents don't know that they actually thank you for when you tell them. And we need to be sure that parents know what their options are and how to support their own children. And you don't have to go in in um, in an you know, arrogant, condescending way telling people what they need to do, but you just say, if you did these things, it might help in these ways. And I think we, parents deserve to have that information. Okay, and I distinguish that from parent engagement, like when parents are working with schools and coordinating with teachers. All right? And then on the, on the um, teacher piece, there are all kinds of ways you, you could break that down. And um, I feel guilty not to having counselors in the diagram, but we can put them in there. And, but it's kids' experience at schools with the adults that they interact with at schools and having the adults in those schools learn to do their jobs most effectively. Okay, and there are various kinds of activities, some of which are in these two circles, but it could be other things. And then the peers. Kids have a huge effect on one another. And we often don't know that or don't use that fact. We have a project where we had detailed deep interviews of 120 Harvard students with how parenting helped them become who they are, the learners that they are. And one of the surprises that came out of that project was that it was often another child who was most important. They talk about it was another child who was like two or three years older, who took them under their wing, who encouraged them, who helped them with their homework, and who they point to as the person who really carried them along and motivated them and, and really was most fundamentally important in determining their success. Right? And so, helping kids understand somebody's watching you, you can have a lot of influence, not only on the younger kids, but also on your peers. And I'll come back around to this fact, this idea about the, the effect that kids have on one another. I should also say as a footnote that I didn't say before, we're not just talking about poverty. The racial achievement gaps are largest among the children of the most educated households. Okay, and uh, we can talk about reasons for that, that, that go back into life experiences. But a lot of the information strategies you talk about, they're folks who are like us. They got their act together. Just give them some information. They'll say, oh, I didn't know that. I can use that. And they go and they do something different. Okay? So it's so poverty and folks who are under lots of stresses are really motivate a lot of us to be really interested and to build our lives to this work. But um, that's not the only place where the problem is. And I don't remember if I kept a slide in here that says when we talk about achievement gaps, it's not even just a racial. There is a gap between white kids in the U.S. and kids in some of the leading nations internationally. If white young people in the United States were a nation, when it gets to uh, problem solving among 15-year-olds, they'd be about 14th or 15th in the international ranking. So there are more than a dozen other nations where by time, age 15, the kids have higher math problem solving scores than white kids in the U.S. So that's another gap that, that we can talk about. Also, so what we're talking about is universal. It's all of it. It's about excellence with equity. It's about differentiation to meet people where they are, but that everybody can make, can make progress and everybody can be part of this conversation. I talk about skill gaps and when they open. At the beginning, I started talking about the parenting and the home piece. Um, if you look, this the the one point old line at the top of this is the um, scores of babies whose parents have some graduate education, who have more than a four-year college degree. 
that's the, the 100% line, the 1.0 line at the top. And there's some difference, and this is, this, this is the racial graph, you do the same thing when you look at by parents' education. There's some differences, but, but everybody's pretty much around 90% or above on this. There aren't that much gap, many gaps. And you can even argue the gaps that there are reflect lived experiences in that first year of life. Right? So we've got explorers options, explorers purposefully, jabbers expressively. Um, but by age two, it looks like that. Okay, so age one, age two. So we've got um, race, ethnicity at age one, high school, uh, parents' education at age one, race, not race and ethnicity at age two, parents' education at age two. So if we want to have some influence on lifetime opportunity differences between groups. Ideally, we would start pretty low, pretty early to try to influence the skills that influence that lifetime, those lifetime opportunity patterns, right? And as I was saying, there's a lot of research, I can send you a lit review on the kinds of things that caregivers do with infants and toddlers that affect brain growth, that affect particular kinds of skills, early in life, and there are group level differences in how much kids actually have those experiences. And that's something that, that we're working on. Okay, the, in Boston, we are probably not too distant future gonna launch a project called Boston Basics. Now we wanna saturate the city, initially one neighborhood, but ultimately saturate the city with these insights for early childhood caregivers. Where if you're in Boston, there's no way you haven't seen the Boston Basics, okay? And it's integrated in with all the other stuff that the early childhood caregiving community is doing. So what's going on now is a lot of that integration, a lot of the networking and collaboration defined. But these fundamental, we hosted a conference three years ago, brought together uh, developmental developmentalist researchers from all over the country, and asked them, what do you know uh, that, the, that the world needs to know about early childhood? And not just early childhood, but, but just caregiving. And this is the distilled list for early childhood. Okay, number one, maximize love, minimize stress. Okay, some of you have heard the phrase toxic stress. In really problematic home environments, the stress is so high that it's got chemical effects on the brain that retard brain development. We need to have people learn that you need to shield that infant from that stress. A parent who is really just depressed and angry uh, needs to find a, a way not to cook the kid with the, with the radiation from that stress, right? And, and to not let people argue and fight too close to the infant, <coughs> and not have infants laying wet and hungry for extended periods of time. All those things cause stress. And stress for infants undermines the development of executive function skills, which are the skills that lead, lead the kid to be able to formulate intentionality and to act on that intentionality, okay? They're gonna be just more staying inside themselves and afraid and hunkering down um, because of the scary world out there as opposed to feeling more free and like the world loves me and welcomes me and I can reach out and engage with the world. Okay, so the important developmental brain-based stuff that happens depending upon that experience of stress early on. And the kids are encoding language prenatal. Uh, there's a, there's a recordings of British and English babies crying that shows that the new infants, uh, the whimper ends in an uptick in one language and a downtick in the other, at the end of it. Babies come out of the womb referring flavors of food that their mother ate while the mother was pregnant. Okay, and so babies are like foreigners in a foreign country trying to learn the language. And we talk a lot of baby talk to them, that's just kind of interfering with that process. So you, they, they like sing-songy high tones, but it's best we real talk from the very beginning. More, much more than baby talk. And so it's about toxing and point. There's really interesting research on pointing and gesturing. They learned it, it helps to accelerate comprehension. Um, and so the combination of a lot of talk, somebody just said just narrate life. A lot of talk along with the pointing accelerates comprehension. Babies learn to point before they learn to talk. Okay. Third one is about laying the foundation for numeracy that we tend to neglect. And so count, group, and compare. Fourth, laying the foundation for the mind's eye. Kids can think and see in three dimensions when you, so you can imagine a toddler crawling around the house, mentally mapping the apartment um, intellectually in, in this three-dimensional brain image, 
right? Picturing what's on the other side of a piece of furniture that they can't see around. Picturing where they left a toy in a different room and they're crawling back to get it. Those same brain functions that help us to think in three dimensions are going to be useful later when we're doing mathematics or when we're playing certain kinds of sports, and even for handwriting, which is spatial visual integration kind of activity. Okay, and the fifth is just the, don't just read, read and discuss. And so, as soon as a kid has the ability to have an opinion, to say something back, include, stop and ask, you know, what do you think is going to happen next? Or why do you think they did that? So we talk about remember, explain, anticipate. Okay, and so the idea is to saturate the city with examples of what these things look like, with little parenting clubs where they talk about it together, with interesting little materials that, that, that folks can have. So we can stop a lot of the gaps from opening before they start, because it's those early life experiences a lot of it comes from. For older kids, there are lots of ways to think about it with this chart, that where the two major dimensions, structure and demandingness, and, and warmth and responsiveness, there are group level differences both by race and socioeconomic status in the extent to which family and parenting fall in these quadrants. What we find for all the groups, particularly for blacks, whites, and Latinos, Asians often there have a different pattern. For blacks, whites, whites, and Latinos, when you're high on both a structure, so they're clear boundaries, but also high on warmth and responsiveness and expression of love, that's when we get the best developmental outcomes, not only academically, but also on, on other psychosocial kinds of dimensions. And we were socialized to parent the way we, we learned to parent from the way we were parented. People think, I turned out all, all right, I'll do it the way I did it. Okay. Middle class white folks tend to be overrepresented down in that permissive quadrant. Not that, you know, a lot of love and responsiveness, but the boundaries are kind of vague at times. Um, African Americans tend to be overrepresented in the upper left quadrant, where we <laughs> where there's a lot of boundaries and rules. You know, do what I said now, we don't need to talk about it. I'm the grown-up, you're the child, just do what I said. Um, and, but not that much open responsiveness uh, a lot of the times. My father was in that quadrant, my mother's actually in the permissive quadrant. So we had this sort of mix there. So these aren't iron rules for groups, but they're tendencies that if we help parents understand, they can make more strategic decisions. It's not about imposing, it's about giving information. Okay, so that's just the, the parent piece. The, uh, talk about school and school quality. Um, all kinds of things happening in schools. We're learning a lot about what makes a difference and how to, how to turn schools and school systems around. Um, just one quick example. I'll give you a com comparison of uh, complacent high school and Brockton high school. There's a report on our website, if you want to look at it, uh, published about four years ago in exemplary high schools. We, uh, every year we go in and we rank order high schools in the state by achieved by their, by their gain data by the growth data, not by their score levels or proficiency rates, but by the things that tell you how much of the kids learn over a, period, over a two year period. So you rank over to the schools that we call them and ask them, how'd you do that? Okay, and so one year we had a conference where we called in from Massachusetts, eight schools that were pretty diverse and also had more growth than others did over, particular, over the eighth to 10th grade interval. And we also called in seven schools from outside of Massachusetts. And it's written up in this report, Brockton is one of them. It was a front page New York Times article based on, on this particular part of the report. Um, if you imagine taking the eighth grade test score distribution, in this case in English language arts, that's what ELA stands for, and rank ordering all the kids in the state by their eighth grade scores and breaking it into deciles. Well, Brockton and Complacent High School had the same percentages of kids pretty much in every decile um, as if you look back to eighth grade. So it's, Talking about a cohort of 10th graders, you say, well, how are they doing in 8th grade? You took them and you rank ordered their 8th grade scores, you broke them into deciles. These schools, these two high schools, Brockton and Complacent, look very similar in terms of the kids they brought in, in terms of where they were in the statewide distribution at the end of 8th grade. Then we can ask, well, now go forward to 10th grade, and for, for each of their schools, ask where does their school rank? In terms of the gains they produce, where does their school rank statewide compared to other schools? And we can ask that for kids who were in the first decile in eighth grade, the second decile in eighth grade, the third, all the way up to the tenth. And we can say, well, for any kid at any particular achievement level at the end of eighth grade, where does the school where they are rank compared to other schools? Well, Brockton looked pretty good in, in math. Uh, 
it looks actually, this is their eighth grade, the levels in math. So English and math, both, they were nothing to distinguish these two schools. By the end of 10th grade, um, Brockton is the, is these bars, complacent is a little blue. So they were among the low, lowest in the state in terms of the learning they produced from 8th grade to 10th grade. Brockton was below average. Average would be the, here the median, the 50th percentile. So if you were in the bottom three deciles, you did not do well as well at Brockton in math improvements as you would have done at the typical school in the state. If you were in the fourth decile up, you were between the 50th and the 80th decile pretty much, or even the 60th and the 80th. So you did pretty well in math. But the story here is really this one, where you're 90th and above, no matter what your score was in eighth grade. Okay? And so we're talking about a school that takes kids at all achievement levels and has them gain more with this particular set of skills than they would have at almost any other school in the state. And we look at the race, the achievement gap numbers, we as, as of um, as of the end of eighth grade, the average scores for Hispanic kids and black scores in Brockton were at about 77, 78% of the statewide average score for white kids. By the end of 10th grade in MCAS, they were at 93% of the statewide average score for white kids. That's like two thirds narrowing of the gap or more in the pace of two years in English language art. Complacent high school was also for black kids at 77%. Same place basically Brockton was. By the end of 10th grade, they were at 59%. Okay, because the kids that weren't learning much of anything. Okay, so we had different schools are differentially effective. At Brockton, what they did was they stopped having faculty meetings. They said we're going to use all our faculty meeting time for professional development. And they said we're going to focus on literacy across the curriculum. So no matter no matter what you teach, you've got to give at least two really serious writing assignments per year, and you've got to grade them using the school-wide rubric that we have created together and agreed on. Now, rubric is in like its sixth or seventh generation now, because every time they see something consistently not included, not going right, they just update the rubric. Okay. After the and the, this is the, the football teacher said, football coach said, I don't teach reading. They said, Well, did you go to college? Did you write papers? Were they helpful? He said, Yeah, but I don't know how to teach reading. So we're going to teach you to teach reading. That's what we're going to do in a time we used to have faculty meetings, and not and really literacy is just more than reading. It's reading and writing and speaking and all those things, right? And so. They do these serious, and so at any particular time, kids might be working on a couple because they've got a building-wide schedule that keeps track of which classes have serious assignments out at any, any one time so kids don't get too overloaded. Okay? After kids complete the assignments, uh, teachers grade them, and then they have to hand the graded work into their supervisors. And their supervisors sit with them and review the feedback they gave to the kids. And they have that conversation. And then the supervisors have to take a sample of that work and sit with their supervisors and have the same kind of review. The standards for quality are clear. Everybody's work is feasible, that is, is visible, I mean. So there's a dynamic in this building. The schools that, that, that hit home runs in math don't do it this way. The places that hit home runs in math have at least one person in the building whose job it is to keep very close track of how every kid is doing in math by domain in math. And then they find ways to target supports to kids uh, in the areas they need supports in. Tech Boston in Boston is 95% free lunch, uh, the majority black and Latino males, and they are 99th percentile year after year in the 8th to, 8th, 8th to 10th grade math game. I asked the principal, how do you, if a teacher's not pulling her weight, how do you handle that? She said, I don't do anything, the teachers handle it. Okay. When the schools get to the place where they are proud and they're doing well, the leadership can kind of step back and it kind of runs. Early on, when it first starts, though, leadership needs to play a really big role and there have to be some non-negotiables in how it's done and it can be a tense process, but it can end up in a really good place and there are schools that are getting the job done. And the challenge is how we harvest what they know how to do, including the informal knowledge. My thing I remember most, I asked the Brockton associate principal, how'd you get all these people to do what they didn't want to do? I said, there must have been some angry conversations in the hallway. She said, no, not really. I said, well, how'd you do that? She said, a couple of phrases turned out were pretty useful. I said, what? And she said, well, help me understand and let us help you. You're facing a resistor. It's, help me understand what you're saying. And you might badger them with help me understand. They, have to, they keep saying things. And then they get to the point where they say, well, I just can't do it. Well, let us help you. 
It's hard for a resistor to get around those two phrases. Okay, and there are other informal things like that you'll find really effective leaders know how to do. Now the peer stuff, so we've been down to the peer to the adolescent piece. And there are negative peer dynamics among kids as early as kindergarten. We do a lot of survey work in schools. And you can ask the question, um, you know, levels of agreement with ki other kids in my class tease me hurt my feelings. Also ask, you know, school is hard. School is hard, yes, no, or maybe. The kids who say yes to school is hard, 40% agree, yes, kids tease me hurt my feelings. Few kids who say no to school is hard, about 20%. Say yes, kids teach me hurt my feelings. That's kindergarten. And we have this dynamic that goes on K-12. I like to think of the, 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 the idea is that um, the, the two curricula in school buildings, the one that teachers teach and the ones the adult, I mean the ones that ones the adults teach and the ones that kids teach. Right? And the ones that kids teach is largely invisible to the adults. And they're they're navigating it on their own. And you, they get to a point where there's a peer culture that a lot of kids don't like, but none of them have the power to change it. And so kids are enforcing upon one another peer, norm, peer norms that they themselves don't even like. But they're trying to fit in. It's, called, it's a phenomenon called pluralistic ignorance. It's been in literature, literature since 1934. Kids need intervention. They need help. And the nice thing is they pretty much already have the right values. They just don't have the social opportunities to live out those values. Okay. They also don't always have the, the supports they need to deal with the trauma and the stresses that are also interfering with them being who they want to be in this. So all the things that we that Janet talked about in the first talk are important things to be in there too, right? And so, but if we can give them the supports that they need um, through counseling supports, if we can give them the supports they need um, to flip the peer culture to be what they majority want it to be, that would, we'd be a few steps ahead. And I'm arguing that's a plausible thing to have done. Um, I'm, I'll just tell you what's on those slides here. We've got evidence on holding back, hiding effort, avoiding help, and misbehaving. And it happens more among the kids who agree that um, because I do things I don't want to because of pressure from other students. Okay. We've got kids who are just trapped in their peer culture. And among those who are doing things they don't want to do because of pressure, we've got up to two-thirds of them holding back from doing their best because of what other people might say or think. Pretending they're not trying hard in school, even when they are trying hard in school. And they're really good pretenders, so the teacher buy the act. And then the teacher says, why should I work hard to help this kid when he won't help himself? He's actually trying, but it's better to look lazy than stupid. And so if he thinks there's a chance he might fail, he's going to pretend he didn't care and he wasn't trying. Right? And also, there's affecting peer impressions. So, so let me wrap up by just saying, if we think kids have different life directions, and all of us do. And imagine you've got three kids, A, B, and C. A is kind of moving off in like direction two and doing pretty well. C is moving off in like direction one and things are going pretty well. But B looks around and thinks everybody's better than I am at everything. Maybe there's no place for me in the world. And there are a lot of kids who are below average on everything. Okay, any distribution, somebody's got to be below average. Right? And so B is looking around and thinking, I'm not worth very much. Okay, often. And so, but imagine there's a star out there where that green star is. Who's in the lead to reach it? <coughs> I see B on a few people's lips. Right? <laughs> okay. A's not going there and C's not going there. B is the only person going in that direction. Okay. And so the idea is for each of us, there is something that will help other people who will enrich other people's lives that is not going to happen if we don't do it. It's our North Star. It's our, our destiny. So we have no way to know what it is, but our life's work is to search for it, try to find it. Okay? And the idea is to help kids know that it's out there someplace. And help them know that it's, there's, there's not a tag on it that, that values it more if it has more education associated with it or makes more money or does anything. It's just whatever is a fit for them. We have to promote the idea that all work is honorable. No matter what you do, it's worthwhile. It contributes to the world. Imagine if nobody did it, right? And so we have a whole community of out of school time programmers in, in Michigan that we're trying to bring together around this kind of idea where we're cultivating future orientations and success mindsets and social emotional skills and communication skills that, are, that school that nobody else has a responsibility to teach. There's a lot of that life navigation stuff that falls between the cracks. 
and helping kids know that there's a, there's a life destination for you to figure out. And if you keep going and don't give up, you'll figure it out. You'll get where you were supposed to go, everybody else get where they're supposed to go, and the world will be nice. Okay. And so, the, and then employers, we want to ask them to help out in various ways. We want to pull the community together, develop a sense of collective responsibility to get this work done. And then we've had the whole picture there. The last question is, whose responsibility to make all this happen? I'll stop with that.